you. And let's welcome Tobias today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I didn't tell Tobias that I was going to create a title for this talk different than the one-on-one -on -one chat with him, but I think you'll like this. L let me know. Lessons in business and life via sports with Tobias Harris. I love it. Thank you. It. <laughs> so that'll be, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break up this session really into four pieces. The first three you'll hopefully care about a lot, but I know the fourth one you're going to care about the most, which is question and answer period from you, the audience. I'm basically going to break up this session into three pieces. The first one, we're going to talk about his pre-NBA career. The second one, we'll talk about his NBA career. And then the third one, we'll talk about what his post-career is going to look like as a business person and as an entrepreneur. So let's start with the pre-NBA. So in business, we always talk about having a diverse skill set. Can't put all your eggs in one basket. So let's start with you as a child. Um, did you play a lot of different sports? And if so, kind of when did you decide to concentrate on basketball? Yeah, so uh, as, a, as a young kid, uh, I, was, I was always locked in on basketball. Probably the only other sport I played was soccer. And they just stuck me in as the goalie. And I was like... <laughs> I was like, this isn't fun for me, right? So then, like every like Saturday and Sunday when I would go play games, I, I came back home. And I was like, tell my mom and dad, I said, I don't want to play soccer anymore. This is not fun. And that was the only other sport I played. And from then on, which was I was like six, seven years old, I just ended up playing basketball, and that was it. So um, from a young age, that was my only focus. My father played basketball. Uh, he was he's an NBA agent at that time as well. So basketball was like in my DNA. That's what my dad wanted myself and all my other siblings to play as well. And uh, I enjoyed doing it. So that was like, for me, that was what I wanted to do. So let me ask you, when did you, I mean, even though your father was an agent and you obviously had talent for basketball, mm -hmm. when did becoming an NBA player become a feasible career path for you? Like, I'll just say for myself, my kids know. I love playing basketball, but I mean, you know, I, no. Yeah. And I realized it very early. So when did actually becoming an NBA player become a realistic goal? So as a young kid, I always had this, these dreams and aspirations. Like when you're young, you're outside, you're shooting hoops, and you're idolizing like being in the NBA, right? But I was pretty bad up, in, up until like seventh to eighth grade, like Compared to my peers, I was never on their level. Uh, when I got into like 10th grade is when I actually started to realize I can really do this, right? Like in 10th grade, I think I was rated like the 138th best player. Like I know that because it was the first time that I was actually nationally ranked and I was very excited about that, right? And from 10th grade on, um, you know, I was in 11th grade, I was ranked like top 15 and then in senior year you know top five and but like at that 10th grade year when I was getting some national notoriety towards me playing basketball I, I knew I can get a division one scholarship and I said I think I can make the NBA like that's a legit goal for me at this point and um yeah from there like 10th 11th grade and being a senior in high school I was like I'm going to the NBA. Like, there's no doubt about it. Like, I'm getting there. I just don't know how long it'll take me to get there. And, um, yeah, that's, that's when I really knew. It was 10th grade. I had this really good feeling that I can get there. So let me revisit something you said. Many of us, when we do things at a young age, and you said there were peers better than you at that age, mm -hmm. we say, well, we'll move on to the next thing. What gave you, if you'd like, the forward-looking knowledge to say, you know, maybe if I keep at this, like, it may not be today that I'm better than them, but it'll be at some point in the future. Yeah, I think uh, I used to get really discouraged that I wasn't on that level, right, with, with my peers. And um, it, would, it would bother me, like, because my father was a coach. He coached a team. And, like, when you're the father's, when you're the coach's son, like, there's all this expectation, like, you need to be good. And, like, I really wasn't that good, but I was still playing, like, and things like that. So, like, those things added up for me. But it, it motivated me. It, it made me strive to, like, realize how can I find a work ethic. Like, you know, when I was young, I used to watch NBA TV all the time and see, like, what the pros were doing, right? And, like, 
I fell in love with Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, his work ethic and, and what he was doing. So I remember waking up at like 5.30 in the morning before I went to, you know, middle school and getting up and running around the neighborhood or like doing jump row because I wasn't fast enough and things like that. So those things like motivated me to improve. And then I just kind of like stuck with that work ethic, but always improved that work ethic year after year to where I'm at now. And that's like, you know, it was like 20 years ago. It sounds crazy saying that because like I'm reminiscing these times of being young, but like I'm 30 now. So it's like, it's kind of a crazy feel. Uh, it's, it's actually a great transition to the next question I was going to ask you, which is, so what do you think allowed you, because we all want to excel in the jobs we have. Um, in your case, I assume being an NBA player is some part mental. It's some part physical. It's some part work ethic. Which part do you think allowed you, in some sense, to catch up? I always say smarter people also work harder, and they also work more efficiently. So for you, what do you think it was? I think of... It's a combination. Like, I think it's, there's definitely this huge element of, like, striving and, and working as hard as I can. I remember, as, a, as a young kid, you know, when I was in ninth, 10th, 11th grade, I would say to myself, I need to maximize every day. So, like, when I was in high school, you know, you could, like, kind of work out your schedule. So I had, like, first and second period off, but I would use that time to work out in the gym, right? And then, like... I move my lunch periods for, instead of being in the middle of the day to be like seventh and eighth, and those were the bottom of the days. And then I would go to the gym again and work out. But like I still did school, guys. Like don't don't get that <laughs> twisted, you know. Uh, but but like I I was organizing like my life based off of what I wanted, right? So I think there's this huge element of hard work enabling me to get to that position. And then you know. This is one of the things that like I figured out later on in my life, but it was just me being creative and using my mind and my imagination to really progress some of those things forward. Like when I was young, I used to always sit back and visualize me getting to different places in life, whether it be like playing division one basketball, you know, being a one and done, you know, top 20 pick. Like I, I legit would sit back and, see those things, visualize them, and then say them as well to people. And, like, sometimes people be like, okay, no, like, no, Tobias. But me, like, that was my goals. And the older I got and the more, um, the more time I get, I realize, like, I do that with a lot of things in my life. Like, I've seen myself driving the cars that I drive, or I've seen myself playing in the NBA, and these things have happened. And I do believe that's one thing. I always tell people, like, some people say, I believe it when I see it, but I say, you got to see it to believe it first. Hmm. Let me ask you about, uh, let's now transition, still pre-NBA, but to your college career. Mm -hmm. So first, what was your experience like at Tennessee playing? And then related, I'm sure everybody here is asked, wants to know from every sports star, what do you think about nil, so people having control of their name, image, and likeness? And do you think it would have changed your career at Tennessee? Like a lot of people say, maybe you wouldn't have been one and done because you could have monetized yourself while you were at Tennessee. I'm just interested to see how, what your thoughts are on that and would it have changed at all your college career? Yeah, um, you know, the, when I was coming out of high school, I was a McDonald's All-American you know, which is, you know, you're a top 25 player in the 2010 class. And I looked at college, picking a college, it was tough because I was choosing between like five really good schools. It was Tennessee, Kentucky, Syracuse, West Virginia, and um, like I think Maryland was, was my other school. But like, I felt like I could go to any of those schools and, and be good and be successful, right? And when I looked at it, I said, okay, you know, I want to be a one-and-done player, right? And I said, Bruce Pearl, he doesn't have, he hasn't had any one-and-done players. So I was like, if he Fs up with me, then he's never going to get another one-and-done player. <laughs> so then I was like, That's you know a fascinating what? perspective because yeah. most people would say, I'm not going there because he's never done it. Your perspective was he's going to put everything he's got into me because if, if you're not the first one, there's not going to be a second one. Exactly. And like... That's really how myself and father looked at the situation was what what school is going to put you in the best position to reach your goals. And, you know, 
granted, coming out, a lot of people didn't think that I was going to be a one and done player. It was more the initial plan with Tennessee was like, you know, Bruce Pearl say two to three years. But in my in the back of my mind, I knew that if I did what I needed to do and continue to work as hard as I I needed to and progress like strength wise, that I can make the leap in one year. Uh, so I was a kid from Long Island, New York, goes to Tennessee, you know, and it's funny because when you're getting recruited, like, you know, coaches say anything, but I remember, you know, this is how sheltered I was as a kid. I remember going on a visit and it was 70 degrees. And the one thing Bruce Pearl, I remember he told me, he says, it's like this here every day. And I was like, 70 degrees, like, say less, you know? And then I just remember, like, one winter, it was snowing. I was like, I just thought of that same thought he gave me. I was like, this guy told me it was 70 degrees every day. It's not, right? So, but it was like, that's like the whole college experience of getting recruited. It's, you say anything to, to, gra- to get this person, to get this uh, player to come to your school. Um, and then when I got there, the teams, uh, we, we were like NCAA, in NCAA sanctioned. So there was, that was the year actually that Bruce Pearl got, um, got fired because mm-hmm. um, all this stuff was going on. So it was, a weird, it was a weird experience, but I felt like I learned a lot from being there. And that was the first time where I realized, okay, look, like I love basketball, I play basketball, but this is a business, yeah. right? And I was like, when we would have practices and there would be like five people from the NCAA sitting on the sideline watching Bruce Pearl's every move. Like he wants to curse in practice. He can't curse because the NCAA is there just watching. I was like, this is kind of weird here. But, you know, we were able to, to make it through and you know, we ended up making the tournament and, and things of like that. So it was a good experience because it was my first kind of step in the bright light of, of what things were to come. So let's now move towards the NBA. And so um, I don't oh, wait, know. Wait, hold on. We oh, yeah, talk we're talking about, about Nil. Yeah, you're going to yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So the, with the NIL, I, I love the NIL because I believe that if a player is, you know, out there playing for the university, they should be compensated for what they bring to the table, right? It, it is a business. And, you know, outside, a lot of people make the argument, oh, you get a scholarship, but there's a lot more dollars coming in for that. So I do think you're seeing a lot of guys, you know, there's, there's players now staying in college and not going pro because there's more money to be made in college. So, you know, you can make the case that some of these guys will stay in college for three, four years because of NIL deals. And, you know, I think that w- w- it, we'll all see with time like how big these deals get and you know will it actually compete with the NBA level like <laughs> you never know there there may be NIL and college sports may compete with professional sports in terms of how much they can pay pay players for their four year duration of time of playing well now let's move on to the NBA so i think i've got this right you've played for five different teams am i correct uh, yeah. so what role would you say, it's something Mankati, Adi, and I, and on our radio show we talk about all the time, is the role of coaching and mentoring. How important is coaching and mentoring? We all want to know this not just in sports, but this is back to lessons in business and life via sports. Mm-hmm. How important is coaching and mentoring in the NBA for professional athletes? Or, you know, you know there's the old expression, you know, Tobias would have been great no matter what, and no one can screw him up. Mm-hmm. W- yeah. What's the real truth? No, um... Uh... In my, in my personal NBA journey, I learned so much through the coaches that I've had and the veterans that I have. Like, as a young player, I came in the NBA, I was drafted at 19 years old. And, you know, it's, it's wild for me now to see because we have young guys on the team coming in at 19, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, dang, like, you were me, like, 11 years ago. You know what I'm saying? And, like... It's just, you come in, you don't know much, you know, you're just listening to whoever is giving you this type of advice, like in your inner circle. And I think I I learned so much through my whole career, through the vets that I had, the leaders that I had on teams, coaches, 
to just learn like patience, number one, in the NBA. And that's for sports, but that's also for life. Like wherever every every single one of you is going to go in, in your future, like patience is super key to just progressing along and, and staying in the moment. Um, but I've had many great leaders, and I try to do that same thing back to the young guys on the team because I, I, I honestly want guys to be able 10, 15 years from now to call me or, or myself calling them saying, congratulations, man, I'm so happy you signed that huge contract. Like, you know, that's what you want to see because you want to see the blossoming, the blossoming and the grooming of yourself to the young players on the team and having them come up so they can do the exact same thing for their, for their young rookies and, and players that they have. Yeah, so it's a per- in fact, it's, it's almost like I, like, uh, Tobias can see what's on my sheet of paper because he's like giving me perfect trend. We call it the big softball when you're interviewing somebody here. So how do you balance working on your own game mm-hmm. versus mentoring young people or as to any boss, if you'd like? I know you're not technically their boss, but you're obviously a highly successful veteran who's had success in the NBA. How do you balance working on your own game versus helping the younger players along? Because, you know, you're, the Sixers are only going to be as great as if everyone's great. So how do you balance that? I, I just really have that, that, um, that whole mentality that we need each other, right? And we need every single one to be at their best day in and day out. And uh, for me, it's not really a huge balance. Like, I think as a person, um, you know, just in my DNA of who I am, I'm a giver. So... I'm always going to be like trying to spread knowledge or trying to sow into somebody. But, you know, the big thing I always say is if somebody is willing to listen, I'm always able to sit down, talk and to really give that knowledge that may be needed at the time. Um, I think uh, I appreciated that I was able to get that knowledge from a lot of veterans and people that I've had over the course of my 12 year career. And it's kind of like you giving back to the game. So for me, that, that's actually my job is to do that because that's what somebody engraved in me. That's my duty back to the game of, of me being blessed and fortunate to be in this league for 12 years now. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you a question. So um, when you were with the Clippers, and by the way, I don't know if you would agree with this characterization, but I would say you, I mean, to me, you were the man. I mean, you were the man on the Clippers. You were the lead player on the Clippers. Now you're one of, I'll call it, if you include Tyrese Maxey, four lead players with the Sixers. How do you deal with that mentally in the sense of, you know, in one case you're the star player, and in one case now you're part of a group of star players, and you may have to give up some of your individual stats that you could still generate for the greatness of the team. And that's what we all do, we hope, as bosses and mentors. Sometimes we have to give up some of the glory for the greatness of the company. How do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, you do. I think when I was, uh, well, I know when I was on the Clippers, the offense was ran I was a a very big focal point, right? Like there was plays coming, you know, actions, everything. So, but also, you know, on the Clippers, the the team ceiling was probably to get to the playoffs, right? Like our team ceiling is not to get to the playoffs. It's to get to the championship, to win a championship. So, you know, you, you always have to look at, there's always two sides to any type of situation. And I think here with the, with the talent we have, with the star power we have, there, there has to be a balance of, you know, what, what needs to be done and people that have to sacrifice. And in my role, I do have to sacrifice for the greater good of, of, the, of the group and the team. And, you know, you don't know if you're going to win a championship. It's, it's very hard to win a championship, but the goal is to win and it's to win big. And I think for me, like, I've always had that focus, like, all right, yeah, you're, you're not, you, you may not get 20 shots today, but it's also, no, like, this team is capable of winning big, right? And everybody has to be able to fill their role and, and to be efficient in a role. And, and I take pride in myself personally is doing things and playing at a way that I'm efficient to help this team win a championship. And, um, you know, people who don't know basketball won't grasp it to understand, like, what 
it actually takes to do it or, you know, if I go and say, no, F that, I'm going to go shoot 20 shots, it'd be just a domino effect of, like, bad habits to go along for the whole group. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, my own personal career at, at this stage in my life, I like being able to compete for a championship, and that's what I want to be able to get when it's all said and done. I can safely say I want that too. Yeah, I think we all do. This <laughs> so how do you deal with the ups and downs that naturally come in the NBA? Because it's an 82-game season. You know, uh, you know, successful teams, really successful teams, win 70% of their games, which is 57 wins in a season. Even as an individual player, if I told you right now you could be a 50-40-90 guy, you'd be like, wait, shoot 50% from the field, 40% from three, and 90% from the line? You would take that, but most any people... Day. Yeah, any day. any day. But most people would say you're missing half... A negative way is you're missing half your shots, you're missing 60% of your threes, and you're still not making 100% of your free throws. So how do you deal with just the ups and downs of not just the game, but maybe in general? What does it say about persistence and life in general? Um, it's, it's a great question. Doing my, my wife, best here. My wife helps me a lot deal with it. <laughs> but uh, um, I think that... It's something that through my 12-year career that I'm each and every day continuing to find out and learn more about. Like, I played basketball my whole life. Like, this is my identity. This is who I am. This is my job, right? And I take a lot of pride in my job, uh, my work ethic, what I do. So sometimes I can get very, like, too attached to my job, like, a bad game or a loss, like those things like weigh on me, right? And um, I think it's it's one of those things where like I've, I try to do different things to kind of figure out where I can get this good balance of knowing that, yo, like you lost the game, it happened, you're gonna have another game. You know, that's why I love back to back. So sometimes it just lets the next game go. And then you're able to well, play. Well, if you had a back-to-back, -back, I don't think we'd be seeing you here yeah, you right won't. now. But, but tomorrow we, night you have a game. There but. you go. But it's like one of those things where you have to, you know, and I think like through my life and I, I meditate and I, uh, you know, I, I read a lot of different things. And one thing that I've learned and I would say the last three, two, three years is just staying present, right? And I think that what that means is, is being in the moment of right now because like in life and this is just this is basketball but this is life but like s things that have occurred in the past or things that you're thinking about in the future like it's kind of irrelevant for the actual moment of right now so sometimes I have to really zone into myself and, and my being of knowing that hey like that did happen but like who are you like why does this affect you so much and I think when I uncover some of those layers with sports and basketball, you know, the thing that comes about is like, because I, I genuinely really care, right? And I think sometimes I, I have to say, it's over, it's okay, let it go, and be ready for whatever's next, or just be ready for this present moment right now. Um, but to, with that being said, it's easier said than done. Um, and it's something that I continue to like, figure out and and this is basketball but it's also business and other things that I have in my life um, but just staying present has allowed me from time to time to be able to be in a good space to knowing that I'm okay with who I am and I'm, I'm present and I'm here and I'm going to be fine. I can just say, only because uh, Tobias and I talked about this before, we kind of got on air here, um, I'm still getting over last night's game, so forget yeah, about you for a second here. <laughs> um, since I'm the vice dean of analytics here, also your general manager of presence, Daryl Morey, 
Obviously, two of your owners are, you know, David Blitzer and Josh Harris, who, you know, are world, come out of the world of quantitative finance and investing. Could you tell us a little bit, whether it's about you personally or the Sixers or just more generally in the league, what role analytics plays today? Like, do you guys have someone that come up to you before the game and says, this person's tendencies or this or that? Or do you happen to be an analytics-oriented person? How do you think about it? Um, I, I, I like analytics. A lot. I do. Let's get I the do. big I hand. Do. <laughs> I do. No, I, I think it's important. I think, like, at, at some point, I don't remember how many years, but when I first came into the NBA, right, they were playing three guards and two bigs. Like, there wasn't positionless basketball, right? The bigs were, you know, you have a straight center, but your power forward is basically a center as well. And I think that like three, four years after the game started shifting where like somebody woke up and decided that three a three-point basket was more than a two-point basket. It's 50% it, it, more, it, by the way. It, exactly, right? So <laughs> then it was like, and then like the Golden State Warriors came along and then started shooting more threes. Houston Rockets, let's shoot more threes. And then it was like the efficiency of, hey, the mid-range jumper for most players, not all players, but for most players, isn't, is, isn't as efficient. Like that guy is better off taking four steps back and shooting a three because if he shoots 30%, 33% there, you know what I mean? It's like That's equivalent to this. So yeah. it was like, I think people started waking up and realizing like, whoa. And then the, the game of basketball shifted to threes, layups, and free throws. Right, it's it's all just math at the end of the day, just very simple math with smart math. Right, so I think that that changed the game. But um, in terms of myself, like those are important things when you look at a career and longevity going forward. Is like the way you stay on the court is to be valuable enough for a team to help them win, to help your team win. Right, so it's like okay. How do you do that at, efficient, at an efficient rate? And, you know, I've always been a, an efficient player in the NBA, and part of that comes from finding the shots that are best suited for me. And part of that is seeing analytics on, on what works. I mean, that's analytics in basketball. There's also now analytics in terms of, like, recovery and things of that, things that, that. Like, you know, this, you guys, I mean, you guys probably know but there's all this data that we have like oh, hey Tobias is running a little bit too fast right now like take him out or like slow him down maybe he doesn't play next game or maybe not that many minutes so all these things um come together and I think it's progressed our 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 league some people may not like it but in my opinion it's like it's the future but it should have already been the future in the past right so but I think it's it's one of those things that um, I wouldn't say it's taken over the league, but I think a lot of teams have adapted advanced analytics um, for, for the greater good of the game. So let me spend the last few minutes I have before turning it over to the audience asking you about yourself as a business person and philanthropist. So how do you decide? I mean, you mentioned your, I think you used the words, you have a, your own personal identity, which means you probably also have your own, in the business world, a personal brand. How do you decide what companies to get involved with? Is it the brand? Is it the category? Is it do you invest in people? How do you think about how you spend your time and also as an investor or philanthropist? Yeah, so um, I'm always, I always look for the intent of what a company is, is doing. Um, you know, that's, that's first. It's like if the intent relates with me. And then I also look at uh, the person that's running and operating whether it be a company, business, whatever they, they have themselves involved in. Because at the end of the day, the person, if I can't look the person in the eye and say, I know this person is going to work his tail off, I can't get involved in it, right? So, um, you know, I do consider, I consider myself a, a, a basketball player, but also an investor. Um, and part of my, one of my goals is always to teach financial literacy, uh, Big time goal for me as a person is to one day have my own school, 
where I'm able to teach kids financial literacy, analytics, like we're talking about now, but just honestly to teach them to dream and to dream big. Um, I'm, I'm an investor in a few companies. Can you just tell us maybe about one of them now? Yeah. You know, uh, so, maybe we can make a bump in sales or yeah, philanthropy you know, right? right now? So I'm an investor in, uh, it's, a, it's actually a milk brand. It's called Neutral, right? And it's carbon friendly. So they use a lot of uh, advanced ways of farming that basically help the environment, right? So I was introduced to this company through the Gate, Bill Gates and, and his team, um, who, who are big investors as well. Uh, so that's something like for me, uh, preserving the environment, preserving the world is is you know something that gets a little overlooked so seeing companies that are able to do that in an efficient way um and this company is doing it at a very high level they're in whole foods if you guys look it up later you'll see it um i was a i'm a brand ambassador of two crumbles out here on the main line which has led me to kind of build that relationship and i have my own. we like crumble crumble's a good crumble's it's, it's amazing real good yeah so i i just recently purchased a, a crumble cookies location actually in evans georgia so when i do things like that it's really to figure out looking into companies i know the brand and i know that they're on the up and up right and you know obviously when you get when you get to purchase a location you're just looking at like P and L, seeing if the business, if the investment made, you'll be able to get back in a in a good period of time. And um, I was able to do that. So, and I was able to do that by getting in the room and being an ambassador first, right? And then building the relationship and then moving forward with that. So, uh, yeah, those are like a couple of my ventures right now, and more will come in the future. And I just take my time and do my due diligence on all of them. Before I turn it over to the audience for questions, I'm saying, uh, I'm sure everyone else is sitting here, I hope you're thinking the same thing I am, which is, as successful as Tobias has been on the court, I'm so confident you're going to be successful in your next career. Thank you. And so it's uh, exciting to hear about the ventures you're affiliated with. Thank you. So let me now turn it over to part four, if you'd like, which is questions from the audience. Yes, please. I, do we have microphones here? Yeah, please. And I'm sure if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself when you ask a question, I'm sure Tobias would like to meet you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dallas Biker Ramirez. I'm a sports management student from Delaware State University, and I am also a student athlete. I play for the softball team. So less on the business aspect and more athlete to athlete. As someone who works very hard and gets frustrated when I don't see the results that I want, what would you recommend just for like sticking through it and keeping to motivate myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I think one, you have to take a step back and also just congratulate yourself, right? Like you can't be too hard on yourself, even when you don't see the results that you work for. Because, you know, sometimes I feel I'm in the same boat as you because sometimes I'm like, dang, I, I work my tail off and I'm not able to do X, Y, Z, right? But it's like, I think sometimes you just got to sit back and realize where you are in that space, in that moment, and figure out how you can really grow from it, right? So I always look at whatever situation it is, no matter, you know, this is sports, in life, in general, right? Like any moment, if you think of like your deepest time or your, your darkest time in your life, and then you think of where you are right now, like you've grown out of that, like it taught, it has taught you something. So... I feel like when you're in those moments, just really sit back and kind of, you know, embrace it, but then allow it to teach you something going forward and let it continue to just strive your and continue to improve your hard work. Right. Like if you're not seeing those results, keep going, keep on grinding. Or, or I, I don't even like saying grinding because I think words are powerful. So I always use the word flow. Right. Because sometimes when you say like people are like, man, I'm grinding hard, like. Grinding is like a word of like, you know, it's like combative. When, you, when I say flow, it's like, man, I'm just flowing, right? Because that's what it should be like. We're just flowing. And your hard work, you shouldn't look at like your hard work as something that you have to do because you're trying to get there. You should look at hard work as something that you just flow through because that's who you are and what you want to do, right? And I think that if you just have that mentality of just allowing yourself to flow 
and just let things happen the way they're supposed to happen because that's really what life is about. Like, you're supposed to just enjoy this ride, learn from everything. Um, yeah, I think that can help you out. But you are great, and you can do whatever you want to do in this world. You know that. All right, no problem. Maybe just to mix it up, we'll take one from the back. Well, just rotate around there, so in the back. button all right cool hey tobias how you doing good yourself i'm doing well man yeah. my name is eddie scott uh, i actually graduated from penn in 21 i'm now pursuing my master's at georgetown university in sports industry management play ball here for four years and uh played ball on the west coast for a year as well now just being now i'm just a student at georgetown i guess uh what i wanted to ask you since you've been in the nba for some time now is um Essentially, I've always been kind of concerned, or I guess one of my passions is, is, you know, my dream to eventually, it was always either to be paid to play, to be paid to play in the NBA, or to be somebody who paid the players, right? Mm -hmm. And so with that being said, um, I'm just a little concerned with the lack of African-American ownership in the NBA, and I'm just curious to see if, uh, since you've been in the league for some time now, how has that affected you? Um, how have you seen it? And as somebody trying to break into the league, you know, what role would be most efficient in, um, in changing that or just to grow the, the balance? For sure. I mean, um, you know, there is a, you know, there's only Michael Jordan, it's the one African American owner in the league, right? Um, you know, I, I, I think that if you if you honestly look around the league, this is a this is a very popular and it's a very good investment of of ownership, right? So not many people have been selling teams. Like Milwaukee Bucks was up for sale some years back. And some of you know who the Mark who was in here had purchased the Bucks. Yep. Um, he was the opening speaker yeah, today, as you know. See? And that, that's, a, that's a really good guy right there, too, as you all know. Um, but he had purchased the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, you know, obviously there's a situation in Phoenix now. But there's not – I don't see a lot of people selling teams these days, right, just because of the valuation of them and how the business of, the ba business of basketball has grown. Um, but to your, to your point – like, I do think and I do strive for this that more, we do need more African Americans to come to the table, building together to figure out ways to break into these doors and, and, and have ownership of, of teams, of sports, if it makes sense, right? Like, I think that, you know, some, there, there are definitely, um, you know, African Americans that can buy an NBA team. I just don't know if it's really on their radar at the time at this time. Um, but you know, I know LeBron wants to purchase a team at, at some point. But I don't think that, like honestly speaking, I think if a team goes up for sale, I'd, I I don't think that there would be any bias towards allowing an African American to purchase a team, right? But I say this to guys all the time in a locker room is. When we're getting these big contracts and when we're making this money, at some point, we do need to come together, like, outside of the playing career and figure out how to turn $100 million into $5 billion, right? And then that allows us to actually get a seat at the table because for some players and, you know, most of the players are black and for some Black players in the NBA, it's always been a thing of players getting the money and then going broke, right? So it's like, as players, we have to figure out, all right, if, if you made this life-changing amount of money, how can you 100x that money or even, you know, 10x, 20x it to the point where if the team does go up for sale, 
we can all get together and come to the table because no one takes no one is taking you serious to buy an NBA team if you're coming to the table with a million dollars. Now, if you got a couple billion, <laughs> now you're in the room. And I, like, I don't care what anybody say. You walk in the room with five billion dollars, and you got five players, and they're black. You're getting a seat at that table to figure out how you can win this team. So, two points to your question is I think that. There is a gap there in terms of, you know, we're talking millions, we're talking billions. There is a gap there. Um, when Michael Jordan got in, runs a successful organization, right? But I think that at that at that uh, at that price point, we we still have some time and some work to do to get to that point. I can safely say on behalf of the Wharton School, we would be happy to help you turn $100 million into $5 billion hey, so you can I, I like be at the that. table. <laughs> we'll do everything we can. And then I'm sure your current owner, David Blitzer, one of your co-owners, would be happy to welcome you to the club. I know David. Uh, yeah, David Dave is the man. For all of you that don't know, David is the man. Uh, we had more questions from the audience. Uh, we'll go over here, please. Try to get a few more in. Hi, um, I'm Karthik. I'm a student here at Penn. Um, I just had a question, like, uh, regarding your career. So I know, like, you've played, like, with Doc Rivers and at the Clippers. You've, you're playing under Doc right now. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I feel like a bunch of us has seen Tisa's vlog, Matisse's vlogs in the bubble. Um, you know, you've played with Jimmy. You've played, you're playing with Harden right now. Um, so you've played with a lot of people, and you've played under a lot of great coaches. Um, if there's one vet or coach and one like rookie or younger player um, that you've said, like that you believe have had a great impact on your life on and off the court, who would they be and why? Um, when I first came to the NBA, Drew Gooden, uh, some of you may know him, some of you may not, but he was this power forward for the Milwaukee Bucks. And I was young, like, like I said, like 19 years old, and I wasn't playing at all. Like it was just DMP, DMP, DMP. But in my mind, I always was like, yo, I need to play. Like I can play. But I was so young, like looking back, I would have, if I could walk up to myself, I'd be like, shut up and go to the gym. Like stop <laughs> telling people you need to play, right? The, but one time we're out, and it was like three in the morning. And we're just at this like pizza shop in Milwaukee. And like Drew, I was like, yo, you think I could play in the NBA? Like, cause I'm not playing here. And he was like, yo, Rook, listen. He's like, listen, if you couldn't play basketball, I would tell you right now that you're not gonna make it. He's like, you can play ball. He's like, it's just not this situation. He's like, just keep working. At some point, you may get an opportunity here, you may get traded, but just stay ready. And I'd say like, you know, that was Drew Good in telling me this at, you know, this is 11 years ago, right? And I think that that moment has always stuck with me because as a young player, you know, sometimes your confidence can waver, whether it's basketball, business, whatever, but just hearing that from him, like, it like gave me life in that moment of like, whoa, whoa, like, this is a vet that's 11 years in telling me this, right? And like to this day, I, I always remember that moment. It was impactful for my own life. And at the same time, like when I see some young guys in the NBA that I play with, like, you know, when Tyrese was a rookie, he wasn't playing, you know? And like he'd be frustrated. I'd tell him, I'd say, Tyrese, you can go to one of these losing teams and you'll score 12 to 15 points. This is him as a rookie. Now he would score 40. But I was like, you can go to one of the losing teams and you'll, you'll do that. I said, but your credibility won't be as high as you doing that on a team that's fighting for a championship. Um, but, yeah, I like to, you know, if I see a young guy who, who works his tail off and, you know, has a good joy to himself of, of being able to be a professional, I always try to give that type of advice to them because that was the same advice that I got that gave me life in my career.
Yeah, it is amazing how I can even just speak on my academic career as a 17-year-old when I showed up here as an undergraduate. One professor, one person can really change your life. And they don't realize when they say something that it'll stick with you. In my case now, for almost 40 years, uh, it can really stick with you. It really can. It's a great story yeah. about Drew Gooden. Uh, we have time for one more question. So let's see. Uh, right here, please. Maybe another Delaware State person question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Talia Capps. I go to Delaware State University. I'm in the master's program for sports administration. Um, this isn't too much analytical, but um, I'm in hopes to work with player engagement, player development, kind of help players with their mental health. And for your opinion, where do you think the NBA or the 76ers is lacking or doing a good job when it comes to like NBA players and their mental health? Yeah, um, no, I think the Sixers does a great job with uh, the needs of of players, mental health. And it's kind of like, it's a fine line because you never want to walk up to a guy and be like, yo, how's, um, yo, you need to talk to somebody, right? Because <laughs> then it's like, whoa, invasion of privacy. But no, like, so it's like some of those side conversations that you do have with people in the organization, like how you feeling, how you doing? Because it's a roller coaster, it's a wave. Um, you know, you never know what, a lot of things add up for different players, but I, I, I think the support from the Sixers has been huge. I know personally, like, there's resources there for us, and I think the NBA has done a good job of imp implementing those resources as well for guys around the, M guys around the league, uh, even through the MBPA. So th th our league does a very, is very progressive, and our organization is as well. But for you that wants to break into the space, you know, I, I would just say that you can do is just figuring out kind of the lane of, of how you get there. Um, you know, I think everybody in this room, one thing I say that will resonate is it, it's all about getting in the room, right? And I think it's all about the relationships you build, how you build them in an organic way to get you in those in those places, right? When we talk about ownership or when we talk about you know, crumble cookies. Like it was, it's all about maneuvering and finding out ways to get in the room, doing it with good intention. Uh, I believe if you're doing something with the right intent, things are going to open up for you. Those doors are going to open up. So, you know, keep, keep doing an amazing job because it, it only takes that one person to meet you, to converse with you and say, I remember that person, you know, and you never know that person could be in Texas somewhere running a team one day and remembers your, your conversation, your, your, you know, the network that you have and, and can use that as a resource. Yep. So before I turn things back over to Michelle, um, let me just say a few closing remarks. So first, uh, on behalf of my dean, Erica James, and on behalf of the entire Wharton School, on behalf of analytics at Wharton, um, I'd like to thank Tobias for being with us here today. I think, um, I know I'll remember many, many things you said, and um, thank you, really, my deepest of thanks. Let's give one big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.